Well, good afternoon, everyone. Please uh, take a seat. Uh, thank you for coming to our event. My name is Mazen Malik. I'm the chair of the DEI committee. Uh, please come in. And uh, this is uh, one of uh, our early uh, or first events that we're really proud of. Uh, Carol Suzuki here is our uh, vice chair, and she is going to do the introduction of our speaker. Carol, please. Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'd, like you, I'd like to welcome you to the Oregon Capital Foundation Speaker Series. Uh, this presentation is the inaugural partnership between the Capital Foundation and the Capital Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and I serve as the vice chair. Uh, together, we are striving to feature significant Oregonians from varied backgrounds who have led remarkable lives, and today's speaker is certainly that. I'm also proud to announce that the Oregon Capitol has been, has recently received the Heritage Award from the Willamette Heritage Center, uh, which honors community leaders and organizations who have contributed significantly to the preservation and interpretation of our shared history. And so um, a lot of that credit goes to Stacy Nally, who's over here and, and being a part of that. Um, just wanted to recognize um, a few folks in the audience. We have Senate President Peter Courtney, uh, Jim Azumano, who was Governor Kulangoski's uh, rural policy advisor, uh, and others here in the audience. And so we're with a group, great group of folks. And so it's with that, it's my distinct honor to introduce Mr. George Nakata. I first met George through the Oregon Nikkei Legacy Center and through our work together on several pieces of legislation on Japanese internment. Um, and we feel that these Bills helped to preserve the history and shed light on a really dark period in our nation's history. Um, some of you may have wondered why I have a tag with a number on it hanging from my jacket. Um, this is the number that was assigned to members of my family after President Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, signed Executive Order 9066. So 16287 was the number for the Suzuki family. and. Um, they and nearly 120,000 American citizens and people of Japanese ancestry living along the West Coast were forced to wear these tags and affix it to all of their belongings and to their person when they were sent to live in American concentration camps. So George and members of my family happened to be imprisoned together at the Minidoka internment camp in Jerome, Idaho. I include my father and grandparents and aunt and uncle and Jim's family. And so um, uh, a little bit more about George. He's a native Oregonian, a graduate of Lewis and Clark College, and he's had a career in international trade and tra has traveled extensively and made over 100 trips to Japan. And recently, he was decorated by the Emperor of Japan with the Order of the Rising Sun with silver rays for extraordinary contribution towards friendship and relationships between the United States and Japan. Um, and today he will share some of his personal stories. And so with that, uh, thank you very much, George, for being our inaugural speaker. Good afternoon. And thank you very much, Carol. It's my privilege and pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and uh, I want to thank the Oregon State Capital Foundation, as well as the DEI, the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. I was able to sit in a few moments ago as they deliberated here. They've been two years old, and I appreciate the good work that the Diversity Committee is doing. So this morning, I want to just share with you a few stories of what happened to Japanese Americans. Let me start by saying that we Americans here sometimes can describe this great country of ours in one word, freedom. Freedom and America kind of go hand in hand, don't they? And yet, yet in our short history, America, our country, has slammed the doors of freedom onto the faces of small ethnic groups. That's been our unfortunate history. Many of us Oregonians here, how many of us realize that in 1859, when we put this great state together, 
we put together a constitution, didn't we? And that constitution barred all blacks. Blacks could not be residents of this great state of ours. It was in our constitution here in the state of Oregon. How many of us understand that when the Ku Klux Klan was at its heyday, America, Oregon what had the largest per capita KKK membership here west of the Mississippi. How many of us understand that? My hometown of Portland, Oregon is the third whitest city of major size in America. These are things that sometimes we tend to forget, don't we? But as we look at diversity, as we look at equity, I think we ought to give thought to some of our rather disjointed past. This morning, I'd like to share with you a story that happened, as Carol mentioned, over seven and a half decades ago. It was at that time when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed an executive order, an executive order that had a number to it, 9066, a number that we Japanese Americans will never forget. That executive order was life-shattering. It was life-shattering to 120,000 Japanese. I happen to be one of them. But before I get into the heart of my story, let's for a moment, we Americans, think about this great country of ours. We tend to forget, don't we, that America is a very young country. We don't think about that. We're only a few hundred years old. There are countries in Europe and Asia that are thousands and thousands of years old. Those of you that travel have seen buildings in Europe, Asia, China that span hundreds and hundreds of years. We are a very young country. And who started this country, really? It was the indigenous. It was the Native American people. A few hundred years ago, there were 562 Native American tribes in this great country of ours. 562. And we took this land away from them. Let us never forget that. This was their land, and we took it away from them. Yes, America, we're a very young country, and we are still learning as we grow. A few months ago, I have to be in Pendleton, Oregon. Many of you have been in Pendleton, had the Roundup, nice city. It was my honor to meet with the elders of the Umatilla Confederated Tribe. Oregon at one time had 28 tribes. But we great American government said, confederated, consolidate yourselves. Now they only have nine tribes. And over there in Pendleton, they used to have the Walla Walla tribe, the Kainu tribe, the Umatilla tribe, and the American government said, put your tribes together. And so they did. They have one confederated Umatilla tribe. And it was my pleasure and honor to meet with them in what they call a sweat house. You sit there and you sit, stay there and just exchange. They wanted to learn about our Japanese experience. I wanted to learn about their Native American experience. And we spent several hours in this traditional sweat house. And one of the elders of the Umatilla Confederated Tribe during the afternoon, he turned to me and he said, my people have been here for 10,000 years. And that stuck with me, 10,000 years. Oregon as a sovereign state, we are 160 years old. And we have people in this state that have been here for 10,000 years. Let us remember that and let us respect that. So the Europeans a number of years ago came flocking here to America. They took over this great land. And a few years later, there was, of course, the Statue of Liberty, welcoming, enlightening them to New York Harbor and this great land of ours. They formed colonies, they pilgrims, and they moved westward, taking over the land from our indigenous friends. And what happened on the West Coast? First, the Chinese started to come. Maybe you don't know that, but the Chinese came and they took care of the California gold rush. We don't give them much credit for that, do you? You never knew that. The Chinese were excellent miners in China for hundreds and hundreds of years, and they came to California and helped the mining. They rarely get credit for that. Not only did they help the mining, 
they were excellent business people. I'm not talking about just restaurants and laundries. They had many businesses. They were entrepreneurs, the Chinese. And how did America thank them? By kicking them out. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act. No more Chinese are going to be added, admitted to this great land of ours. That is thanking some immigrant minority people in this land of the free. Let us remind ourselves that we're all immigrants. All of us can trace our grandfather, great-grandfather, great-grandmother to some place, be it Asia, be it South America, be it to Spain, Bulgaria, Russia, France, Korea. Unless you're indigenous, we are all immigrants, and we tend to forget that. So the Japanese started to come in the year 1880. The very first Japanese to set foot in Oregon was a lady by the name of Mio Iwakoshi. She settled in a place called Gresham. People that you know in Portland, you know the town of Gresham. If you drive around Gresham, there's a little sign out there, a little pocket of Gresham called Orient. That little community of Orient next to Gresham was named by Mio Iwakoshi in the year 1880. After that, several hundred people came from places like Okayama, from Wakayama, from Hiroshima. And by the year 1900, there were several thousand Japanese here in this great state of ours. They were all bachelors for the most part to begin with. They worked on railroads. They worked in fish canneries, lumber yards, and on farms. Those were excellent farmers. I don't say that lightly. My father came from Okayama, Japan. He was a rice farmer. He came here to Oregon. There was a Meiji period in the historic Japanese history. The time of the Edo period was the samurai building castles on mountaintops in Japan. And then there was the change into modernization called the Meiji period. And that's when they started to tax the farmers of Japan, double and triple the taxes. And so people couldn't make a living. And so they looked. They looked beyond the Pacific into Hawaii, to Canada, to Brazil, and yes, to the west coast of America. And they came. And they settled here. Many thousands of Japanese. They were good farmers. Not only were they good, they were excellent. Within a decade and a half, Mind you, within a decade and a half, they produced 90% of Oregon's broccoli, 65% of the asparagus, 80% of Brussels sprouts, and on and on it goes. They were excellent farmers. And what happens with that? The white neighboring farmers didn't like that because they would produce more per acre than they would. And so they started to dislike their neighboring Japanese farmers. And up and down the West Coast, it was an unfortunate situation. Here in the Northwest, they were still connecting cities. Mind you, I'm not talking about 2019. I'm talking about the early 1900s. Seattle, Spokane, Tacoma, Portland, they're still being connected by railroads. My father worked for the SPNS, the Seattle, Portland, and Spokane Railroad. They worked 11 hours a day. My father wasn't tall. He was five feet three and 117 pounds. But he lifted the rail ties. He pounded spikes for 11 hours a day, making $1.75 a day. They grossed $35. Out of that was taken a translation fee and a contractor fee. They ended up with $27 a month. I used to tell my grandson, you and your Fortnite video games, you pay more for the video games than my father made for a whole month. That's how it was. So we have to understand different times, the hardships that the first generation Issei, first generation Japanese, as they pioneered and tried to establish life here. You have to understand that when people pull up their roots in a foreign country and make America their country of choice, this is where their commitment is. This is their future life. That's the life of the first generation Japanese. It was not easy, but they established themselves up and down the West Coast. And you know, at that time, when your neighbors don't like you, mayors don't like you, Mayor O'Reilly 
city of Portland, he hated Japanese. He hated a lot of people that were non-white. He was the one that sent several thousand Romanians to San Antonio, just an executive mayor decision, Mayor Riley. There are some governors that didn't like you, like us. Indeed, all the way up to the President of the United States. What happens when a situation like that occurs here in this land of the free? What happens? People are human beings, and human nature sets in. What do I mean by that? Human nature sets in. You tend to band together with people of your own kind. People that have the same culture, maybe eat the same food, maybe have the same language, you tend to band together. That is what created Japantown. That is what created Chinatown. That is what created Koreatown. Make no mistake about it. When I was in college, someone asked me, George, how did, how did Japantown ever come to be? He had the misgiving that some town in Japan suddenly picked up and planted itself in Northwest Portland. That's not how it works. It was forced upon the Japanese people by the unfriendly, unacceptable ways of the white Caucasian neighbors. It's hard for me to say this, but that's the raw fact. And so 49 different Japan towns were created from south of San Diego to north of Seattle. Many right here in Oregon. This is Japan town in Hood River. One right here in Salem, in Mono Villa, southwest Portland. The largest Japan town of all was in northwest Portland. Those of you familiar with Portland, think about Ankeny Street to Gleason Street from the Willamette River up to Northwest Fifth. That 22 square block area was Nihomachi, Japan town. 110 businesses there, almost 200 families. None of the shops were big. We had 110 businesses, yes, all small shops. There's a fish market, a bathhouse, a candy shop, a jewelry store, a barber, a doctor, a dentist. Yes, there was a school there, Japantown. They didn't have homes like you have. They didn't have a patio. They didn't have a backyard, a living room, a dining room. They lived above a fish market behind the garage, behind the shop. The sidewalk was their playground, Japan Down. I know, I was born there. I grew up there. Japan Town Portland was my home. It was a thriving community. I remember going down Third Avenue to Third and Davis Street, going to this little confectionery shop. They had these manju sweet cakes. And my sister Mary and I, we wouldn't have a quarter at that time, but when we were good enough to get a quarter, we'd run down to that snack shop, get a small paper plate with five different manju sweet paste on there. I still remember that day. I still remember pressing my face against the window of the Sakano jewelry shop there on Northwest Third. And I'd look in the window and look at that Mickey Mouse watch, how I wanted that Mickey Mouse watch. But my sister reminded me, Papa can't afford that. It costs $13. He can't buy that for you. But I never forgot about the Mickey Mouse watch. Those are memories of Japantown that I had. Very pleasant Japantown as a community. We had a Japanese school. We had fine dentists and doctors there. Everything was fine, but it was not an acceptable way to live because for us to go outside of Japantown was not easy. My father told me many stories of going to downtown Portland to buy supplies. Merchandise in one hand, money in the other hand. Waiting, waiting for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, never to be served. Has that ever happened to you? That happened to the Japanese many, many times. Mm -hmm. Difficult times. And the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, it's an organization that for some reason like to make lists. They're always making lists and at that time, in 1939, 1940, they made a list of 1,370 Japanese living up and down the West Coast. They might be spies. They might be dangerous of espionage. Really? After World War II, I looked at that list. There were 78 Japanese from Oregon on that list. People like Mr. Yasui of Hood River, Oregon, the father of Minori Yasui, was on that list. My doctor, Benjamin Tanaka, was on that list. A florist from Japantown, Mr. Inuzuka, 
Mr. Miyaki, the teacher in our Japanese school, Mr. Oyama, the editor of our Japanese newspaper, don't tell me these are not law-abiding citizens. They were excellent people, and yet the FBI said they might be spies. That's the environment that we lived in. It's hard for you today to imagine. Sitting here in the comfort of the Capitol, listening to someone recite something that happened back in the 1940s. Those are very difficult times, particularly when you're Japanese American. I'm a citizen of this great country of ours, but maybe I don't look like you. Maybe I don't talk like you. Maybe my name is not as easy as yours to pronounce. That makes it very difficult. But those were very difficult times. Yes, and then what happened? It all blew over. It was a time when Japan and America were not getting along. I don't have to tell you folks, when America, mighty America, gets mad at you, it makes it very difficult. All you have to do is ask Cuba, ask Syria, ask Afghanistan, ask North Korea. When America gets mad at you, it makes it very difficult. And in the late 1930s, America got mad at Japan. In 1939, they decided, we're not going to trade with you, Japan, anymore. We don't like you. They ended the trade treaty. Some of you have probably traveled to Japan, or you know Japan. Japan is a country of islands, hundreds of islands. If you put them all together, it's about the state of, size of the state of Montana, of which they have half the population of the United States crammed into that small area of which only 17% of the land is arable. That is Japan. Japan must import and export for its very survival. And now big America says, we're not going to trade with you anymore. That left Japan in a pickle. They also made demands of the ambassador in Washington, D.C., impossible demands to really meet. For example, they said, Mr. Ambassador, your Japanese here in America must all speak fluent English. Now, they didn't make, America didn't make that demand for the Germans, for the Italians, for the Hispanic, only singling out one ethnic group that they were mad at, Japan. Is that really fair? Is that really representative of the land of the free? That's what happened. Really very difficult times. And then it all blew over December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. You all know the story. Hundreds of our naval personnel killed. Battleships, cruisers sunk. FDR declares war on Japan. A terrible time, December 7th. And a couple days later, he declares war on Italy and on, Russia and on Germany. As I look out at this crowd, I can tell by looking at you that many of you have never witnessed a world war because you're younger. I hope you never experience a world war. I'm not talking about the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War. I'm talking about the entire world at war, 55 countries. I'm not just talking about two or three countries. The entire world at war, two different groups. America, we've never been invaded. No. But I've been to countries that have been invaded. I remember living here when the war broke out. People running around Portland, extra, extra war. And suddenly we find ourselves doing what? Buying war bonds, pounding down tin cans to save the metal. Sugar is now on ration. We have no butter. There's something called margarine. Life is different during a world war. I hope you never experience it. Those were different times. And we Japanese on the West Coast, we are confused, stressed out, and in chaotic condition. What's going to happen to us? We saw all the posters. They call us many names. The Yellow Terror, the Fifth Column. Many, many names that they just call us Japanese. It was not easy. It was not easy to just go around. 
children reading books by somebody, an author by the name of Theodore Geisel. Theodore Geisel, very common, very popular author and cartoonist. He made 400 cartoons of Japanese during that time. Every cartoon was the same. By the way, Theodore Geisel never met a Japanese, but he was good at making cartoons. Every cartoon of a Japanese, thick glasses, buck teeth, slant eyes, they all looked the same. He was also an author and wrote many, many children's books. You knew him as Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. Yes, those were things that you see on billboards, read in newspapers, and we are the victims of that here in the land of the free America. So they were very, very difficult times. And then, of course, came the FBI. A few days after the war broke out on, Fe on December the 7th, in the next five days, they arrested 1,300 Japanese up and down the West Coast, including 78 here in Oregon. I can tell you many stories. Time won't allow. Let me share with you just one story. One story of a good friend of ours, Mr. Umata Matsushima. He owned the Teikoku store on Northwest 3rd and Davis Street there in Japantown. A very fine gentleman. Everybody in Japantown knew him. He used to come out and greet all his customers, tell us the news of the day. He was a wonderful person. But what happened on the night of December the 9th, 1942? He lived above his store, a rap on the door. Two gentlemen come in and identify themselves as from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They said, Mr. Matsushima, you are under arrest. They gave no reason. And after the war, he told me exactly what happened. His wife, who spoke very little English, is in panic. What's happening with her husband? The two sons running around. What's going on with Papa? And he told me. They came in, and they gave him 35 minutes. 35 minutes to grab his toothbrush, toilet articles, warm clothing, boots, hats, a muffler. And they handcuffed Mr. Matsushima with no reason, no charge. They handcuffed him and brought him downstairs and threw him into the back of a patrol car with a screen between the driver and the passenger seat. They drove him out to southeast Portland to a place called the Rocky Butte Jail. Those of you that are old-time Portlanders know it was out there, they closed it up for the freeway, the Rocky Butte Jail. They threw Mr. Matsushima into a cell, and they gave him so-called breakfast the following morning. Breakfast. Breakfast was a metal tray, a small metal tray, with a small bowl of oatmeal and black coffee. Now, they didn't place that into a cell. They placed it outside his cell. So Mr. Matsushima had to reach between the bars, pick up whatever oatmeal he could, most of it dribbling down his face and onto the floor. Mr. Matsushima told me, George, I was treated like a rat. He was there at the Rocky Butte Jail for two weeks and then sent to a federal detention camp in Missoula, Montana, on to New Mexico, Arkansas, and ended up in a place called Crystal City, Texas. Finally, after two and a quarter years, his wife and two sons joined him. They didn't know where Papa was. They tried to send letters which was blacked out by the American government. Finally, after over two years, they rejoined Mr. Matsushima. One of 78 stories that happened right here in the state of Oregon. So then came the Executive Order 9066, and General John DeWitt is in charge of 120,000 Japanese on the West Coast. And he gives us so-called exclusion orders. 80, 80 exclusion orders by the time he announced in August of, of 1942. 80. He would send us exclusion orders every day of what we Japanese could do and could not do. He set up what's called civil control stations up and down the West Coast. One of them was right there on 3rd Avenue in downtown Portland in Japantown. I used to go down there with my father, who did not speak fluent English. And I remember going there one day, and this authoritative gentleman looking up at us and pointing up at us and telling me, 15066. And just like Carol, I had then a family number, 15066. I was so young, I didn't even have a social security number. Now I have a family number, 15066. 
And pretty soon he gives us evacuation orders in April of 1942. We are removing all of you Japs into concentration camps. You can only bring that which you could carry. Now think of that for a moment. You can only bring that which you could carry. I'm a little boy. I can't carry very much. My father and mother got rid of everything. And I mean everything. Somebody once told me, well, why didn't you let, give it to your neighbor? I said, excuse me, I live in Japantown. My neighbor to my left, to my right, they're all Japanese. We're all going to the same place, wherever that is. And so we got rid of everything. My mother, I remember to this very day, weeping as she got rid of her silk kimono that she brought over from Okayama, Japan. I remember my father selling his Ford pickup for $35. I remember my sister Mary having the full set of Japanese Girls Day dolls, having to get rid of all of them. I remember my parents in 1939 buying this General Electric radio. I don't remember, I don't talk about radios like you have, small transistors. In those days, a radio was a piece of furniture, mahogany, substantial. They paid $100 in 1939 for that General Electric radio. They got rid of it to a policeman on the beat for $5. Why do I tell you of that little story? That is just indicative. It is symbolic of the financial hardship that the Japanese faced before we had to leave for some concentration camp. So then it was May the 5th. They took us in alphabetical order. It was May the 5th that we then went to the middle of Japantown and got on these yellow school buses. And they took us to North Portland. And they dropped us off at this place. It was the North Portland Livestock Yard. Livestock Yard. Yes. Pig pens, horse stalls, chicken coops, animal barns. But good enough for those Japs. That's the attitude of the American government. Over 3,000 of us on that day. I remember to this moment walking into that building. First of all, it's surrounded now by barbed wires. There were two guard stations with spotlights. And I remember the front gate walking in. And I remember these two soldiers with M1 rifles with fixed bayonets scared the daylights out of me. I am a young boy. It looked like swords on the end of rifles. It's frightening to a young boy. It leaves an indelible memory in your mind that you'll never, ever erase. And I walked into that building, this livestock yard, and I remember the pungent odor of manure seeping through the wooden floors. I remember fly paper, black with flies, hung all over. I remember pigeons and sparrows flying around and inside this maze of plywood. I remember ours was in section number three, 14 by 19, four army cots, on each army cot, a little canvas bag. Take that canvas bag into the center. There's an arena there. They used to have horse shows there. Now there's a big pile of hay. Take that hay, stuff it into these canvas bags. That will serve as your mattress. I remember that night, May the 5th, 1942. Lights out, 10 o'clock. All the lights are out. And there we are. I, as a young boy, on this mattress with straw poking me up and down the back. And I'm listening. You know, all these plywoods, they're only eight feet tall. You hear everything to your left, to your right. I'm listening to children crying. I'm listening to people whispering. I'm listening to women weeping. And what am I listening to? I am listening to the sounds of shattered lives. That's what I was listening to. 3,000 of us incarcerated by the U.S. government into this so-called Portland Assembly Center. Those of us incarcerated, we never called it the Portland Assembly Center. That's using the English language and euphemism at its best. Taking a word and making it more tame, making it more gentle. We called it the barbed wire barn because that's what it was. Please don't call it the Portland Assembly Center. Call it for what it was. We lined up 1,800 strong for the mess halls. I remember my mother 
every day in Japantown serving us Japanese food. Suddenly, on my plate is something called cow tongue. I never had cow tongue in my life. Next day, there's mutton. Mutton so old, you can't even cut it with a knife. And I look up and down this long row, and everybody has their mutton left. One time, you know, those of you familiar with Oregon, there's a sandy river. There's a smelt run, that little fish called a smelt. Apparently, they had a lot of smelt one year. So they gave a smelt for two days in a row. And I'm talking about breakfast, noon, and dinner. Six meals in a row with smelt. I started to hate smelt as a young boy. And ever since, I don't eat smelt because it left this impression on me, this smelt, this fish. Free fish, yes, good enough for those incarcerated. Those were the times. I remember going to take a shower. This is gonna sound funny to you, but we Japanese, we normally take what's called ofudo, baths. They took baths in Japan. You kind of wash yourself and then get into a soaking tub. That's a traditional Japanese way. And suddenly I'm in this place and there's these things coming out the wall and I'm in this line with this last, I'm waiting. And I finally get in there and I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. I manage to finally turn on the knob and some water comes squirting out and I stand there and I guess this is a shower and I'm looking to my right and this man with his infant boy standing there and to my left this elderly Japanese gentleman speaking Japanese to me and I'm, and I'm just bewildered. I'm wondering, what am I doing here? Why? We Japanese, we committed no crime. We had no trial. We had no due process. The only reason we were incarcerated was because of who we are. Here in this land of the free, America. That's how we were introduced there. It was not an easy life that summer of 1942. Education is very important to Japanese. But we had no books, no pencils. But we went to the arena and they started schools, ex school teachers, the fifth grade here, the seventh grade over here, the third grade over here. And finally, finally, the Red Cross and the Quakers. And I'm forever thankful for them. They sent us some used books, pencils, and we can continue our education there in the arena of this barbed wire barn. So we spent the summer there in this place, and then it was September. And news came around that the permanent American concentration camps are now ready, 10 of them. They had 15 of these temporary way stations. They had one in Puyallup, Washington, it was the stables that the Seattle people went to. The Santa Anita racetracks where the Los Angeles Japanese were incarcerated. 15 of these temporary stations and now these 10 permanent concentration camps are now ready. Names that I never heard of before. Names like Manzanar, Heart Mountain, Topaz, Postum. Yes, they were now ready. And so they brought us down to the Union Station in Portland and put us aboard trains. Trains. And the first thing I noticed was the MP, the military police, marching up and down the aisles. They ordered us to pull the window shades down. We're not to see where we were going. Remember, I'm talking about 1942. America is not a mobile society. Many people didn't have cars. There were no commercial airlines. You didn't travel then. We in Japantown, we rarely went east of Multnomah Falls. And suddenly we're on this train, rolling, I guess, east. I can ask you a question. Have you ever taken a trip where you don't know where you're going, nor how long you're going to be there? That is the stressful question that was going through our minds as we sat on that train, rolling east. And suddenly in the middle of the night, the train stops and somebody says, we have to get off. And we did with only that which we could carry. And someone says, we're in Idaho, Idaho. To us, it could have been Greece, Russia, France. We had never been in Idaho. It wasn't a traveling society. Suddenly we're aboard more buses and then we're taken out to the sea of sagebrush. Nothing but sagebrush, <coughs> dust, tumbleweed, coyotes, sagebrush. 
and under the moonlight we can suddenly see what looked like barracks, hundreds and hundreds of army barracks. Yes, this is Minadoka. Minadoka, one of the ten concentration camps. Those of us from Portland, from Seattle, from Spokane, from Tacoma, from the Pacific Northwest, we are going to be incarcerated here in this camp called Minadoka. Many of you here have never heard that word Minadoka before. I had the honor of meeting some Shoshone elders of the Shoshone tribe, and they said, oh, Minadoka, that's a Shoshone word. It means vast expanse, and that's what it was vast expanse of nothing. So we got there and gave them our family number 15066. They said, hmm, you're in block number 34. There are 44 blocks, each block with 12 barracks, each barrack with six units from A to F. 72 families make up one block with a mess hall, dining room, shower place. 44, surrounded by barbed wires, eight guard stations, two of them with machine guns, rest of them with M1 rifles, all pointed in. American propaganda. We stuck those Japanese in the camp for their own protection. Yeah, that's why the guns are pointed in, right? Propaganda at its best. So there we are, block number 34. My family were ordered to go to barrack number six. So we find barrack number six, and they said, go into unit A. All right, Minadoka, block number 34, barrack six, unit A, 346A, the new home, if you will, for family number 15066. It turns out that some 9,500 of us are eventually incarcerated in this place called Minadoka. It was dry, desolate, I remember the first days there, I would look at the fence and there would be coyotes right up against the fence looking in at us. Some of you have maybe seen coyotes. They look like dogs. They look like dogs until you get close to them and their eyes are different. Their eyes are wild. They're not like your domesticated poodle that you have. That's how they are, wild dogs. And of course, rattlesnakes, ticks, scorpions, we'll soon find out. Our place, ankle deep dust, tumbleweed running around. It was a different life there in Minadoka. But the Japanese people are resourceful people. We tried to organize ourselves. We organized the block manager. Those that cooked volunteered for the mess hall. Those that were good at something tried to start schools, for example. But we had too many students and not enough teachers. We tried to start a high school and two grade schools, Hunt High School, Huntsville, and Stafford School. Our school had 750 students and only 10 teachers. So they had to go out to Twin Falls, Rupert, and Eden, the nearby communities, and recruit new teachers. But remember the environment. America is at war with Japan. If you're a teacher, do you want to go in and teach Japanese children? Yes, good teachers are dedicated to education. And good teachers from Eden, Rupert, and Twin Falls came. I'll never forget Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Edith Kleinkoff, Miss Morton, the teachers that we had inside the school. Excellent, excellent teachers. And I remember pledging allegiance to the American flag each and every morning. Freedom and justice for all, as I looked out the window at the barbed wire and the guard stations. That's how it is when you're in a concentration camp. Yes, we tried to make do. We dug a great big hole near block 30. It became our swimming pool. You couldn't even see the bottom of it, it was just a mud hole. That's all right. We can go there during the summertime and maybe enjoy a few hours of swimming in the mud. We had a chicken wire that we made into a backstop, became our baseball diamond. Yeah, the Red Cross, they sent us a few things. Our team only had two mitts, one for the catcher and one for the first baseman. We had two bats, one of which was cracked with a nail on it. That's all right. We can play a little baseball. We try to make best of life, whatever's handed to you. 
and I can tell you many, many stories inside Minidoka. My mother got sick. The hospital was located down there near Block 5. My sister Mary and I, after school, took that three-mile walk every day for one month just to see my mother. I'm not feeling sorry for myself. Many families went through many hardships there inside the Minidoka camp. We tried to make do. We finally got one-day passes to go out beyond the barbed wire. Yes, go beyond the barbed wire? What do you see? Nothing but sagebrush. It's not too exciting going beyond the barbed wire. We got to see a little bit of the North Canal there, and we got to look for this special wood called greasewood, a manzanita variety that in miles and miles you might find one. We'd bring it back, peel off the bark, shine it up, and make something out of it. Many of us in Minidoka came back with a little piece of greasewood. That is our one and only memento that we brought back from Minidoka. I can tell you many, many stories of Minidoka. Let me just uh, reflect back on Christmas. Christmas in America is a very important holiday. And what do you do in a concentration camp to celebrate Christmas? Well, the Japanese Americans decided, let's decorate our mess halls. Let's give a little bit of the Yuletide season to those of us incarcerated. And there's a, a camp-wide contest to see which mess hall can decorate itself the best. And it was unbelievable. I don't know how these Japanese Americans did it, but some of the mess halls were absolutely winter wonderlands. They took sagebrush and decorated with flour from the kitchen and made, I don't know how they did it, but they converted the mess halls into something to be proud of. And as young boys, we ran around to look at the different mess halls to see which one was the best. And I remember going around with my friends, and we'd go, and I, and I saw in a window a banner with a gold star. And I asked my older friend, what is that? Well, don't you know, the family that lives in that unit lost a son fighting for America. Sobering. I walked on, and I found a banner with two gold stars. And yes, the family that lived in that unit lost two sons fighting for America. For you see, the U.S. Army, at that time that was called the U.S. Army Department, decided that in 1943, let's have some of these strong Japanese Americans in these camps form a totally segregated unit. And so they volunteered. They volunteered from Minidoka, Heart Mountain, Topaz, and from Hawaii. And they created the 100th Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the 442nd. They trained in Fort Shelby, Mississippi. They went on to fight for America in North Africa, Italy, Germany, France. The 442nd, this is the unit that liberated the town of Briere on the French and German border. And for 50 years thereafter, the people of Briere flew back a Nisei soldier to help them celebrate their year, day of liberation. That's what they thought about the Nisei. Yes, the Nisei, they did many things. There was the lost Texas battalion, totally surrounded by the Nazis. When two divisions of the U.S. Army failed to rescue them, the 442nd, under heavy casualty, rescued the lost Texas battalion. Many, many stories I can tell you about. Many of you read of the Jewish Holocaust, a historic event that is the most horrific, terrible thing in humanity. I'm so glad that the Oregon legislature and signed by Secretary Brown that from next year, 2020, they're gonna teach the Holocaust in schools throughout Oregon. Should have happened a long time ago. History is history. Let's not pick and choose what we put in the history books. If it happened, it happened. Let's learn about it. And so there was, in 1933, Adolf Hitler, the crazy guy, made over 100 of these camps. 100. Some of them were slave camps. Some of them were extermination camps. Some of them were concentration camps. One of the oldest camps was located in Dachau. 
Dachau is a few miles from Munich, Germany. I served in the army in the early 50s. I visited Dachau. I saw their ovens. I saw their gas chambers. I saw the writing on the wall of people few hours from being exterminated. I saw a simple grave with this little plaque that said, here lies a thousand Jews. I'll never forget that. But let me bring you back to April the 29th of 1945. The 442nd was marching as the Allied troops landed in Normandy and they were moving and the Russian troops were coming and the Germans were fleeing. They were fleeing from all the concentration camps, including the death march of Dachau. And it was the 442nd, a part of the 442nd, that there landed right there as the death march was happening. And it was the Nisei soldiers that took it was several camps that make up Dachau. The largest subcamp of all, they blew off the lock and opened the gates. And the Jewish prisoners could not come streaming out simply because they were unable to. Their skin and bones, they were weak. They came crawling out. And when they came crawling out, they stopped abruptly because the soldiers, they looked Asian. And the soldiers explained, don't worry. We happen to be Japanese Americans, but we are the U.S. Army. You are now free. There are many Jewish elders that know that story. The rescue by the 442nd. <clears throat> you know, in the annals of U.S. military history, the 442nd for its duration and its size, is the most highly decorated unit in U.S. Army history. They had over 9,486 Purple Hearts. The total unit only had 18,000. Just think of that. Every other person in that unit got a Purple Heart. They had 22 Medals of Honor over 500 distinguished service classes, and I can go on and on. Japanese Americans, many of them are now gone. My good friend Art Iwasaki passed away several months ago. He had a nursery in Hillsborough, Oregon. He had two Purple Hearts. He still had sh shrapnel inside his hip. Just one example of the bravery of Japanese Americans. And then, of course, it happened August of 1945. You know what happened, the atomic bomb. Dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nagasaki was really not the target. There was another city, but weather then forced them to drop the second bomb onto Nagasaki. And you know the story. 250,000 Japanese either killed or maimed for life. A story for another day. Now the war ends. And those of us in Minidoka, they says, you're now free, you can go home. No. So we go down to the Twin Falls Rail Yard and they give us a ticket from where we came from and $25. $25. My father came here from Okayama, Japan, an entrepreneur who had a hotel in Japantown and two markets on North Columbia Boulevard. He lost everything because of the war, and he's given $25 to get life started again. Well, we get on the train, and this time the train ride back to Portland is different. The window shades are up. And I remember rounding the bend and seeing the Columbia River for the first time in three and a half years. And I remember that sight. To those of you, the Columbia River is just a river. But on that train, on that time, rounding the bend and seeing the Columbia was to me a mark of freedom. I no longer had to look at the guard towers. I no longer had to look at the barbed wire fences. So we got back to Portland. And I remember setting foot in Portland at the Union Station, and I turned to my sister Mary and said, Mary, we're finally home. Japantown is only seven and a half blocks away. And she said, no, George, remember, there is no Japantown. And she was right. 
There was no Japantown. It disappeared. When we evacuated from Japantown, Chinatown moved from, you know, south of Burnside and took over the former Japantown. And now those of you that go to Portland think that that's Chinatown because there's a big gate there. Let me remind you, if it wasn't for the war, it would be still Japantown like Seattle, San Francisco, San Jose, San Diego, and Los Angeles that have had a Japantown continually, except Portland. I'm very sad by that. So we were put into a housing project out at St. John's. We picked berries and picked beans for our very survival. I remember going to a Goodwill store to buy clothes so that I can have something decent to wear when I go back to school. And going back to school, I went to James John School in Lombard Street. I was the first Japanese to enter that school. And my teacher looked me up and down and she said, sit in the back, not at a desk, at a, at a table in the back. Well, okay, so I sat in the back. And I'm looking forward, and I remember this girl student, fellow student in the front desk, opening up her pocket purse and getting out this hand mirror and she's looking back at me. Apparently, she'd never seen a Japanese before. That was my introduction to returning to education back in Portland. The next day, my family went out to the Rose City Cemetery, where my older brother was buried. And as we entered the cemetery grounds, I knew something was wrong. There were two families there, the women were weeping. And as I entered, I knew the tombstones were all toppled and demolished. Why? For the life of me. I cannot understand human beings that destroy the final resting place of loved ones. But they did. They destroyed the entire Japanese cemetery. We could not find the location of my older brother's tombstone. Does America learn from these history, historic lessons? I wonder. 2017, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a cemetery destroyed because it happened to be Jewish. Don't we ever learn? I'm disheartened by those things, and they kind of stay with me. In 1952, my parents got to file for citizenship not easy. My father got to take his test in Japanese because of age. My mother had to take hers in English because she was younger. My sister and I drilled her for three months. What's the Bill of Rights? What is the Constitution? How many articles? What's the minimum age to be a son? All of this. She passed with flying colors. And I remember going to the Multnomah County Courthouse, 75 Japanese immigrants becoming citizens of this great country of ours. And there were no finer citizens. Those 75 voted in every election thereafter. They studied every candidate. They studied every initiative and measure. Those Americans, we, only 53% of us even bothered to vote. Those 75 voted in every election thereafter. Fine, fine citizens. And in 1982, American Congress decided to re-examine Executive Order 9066. Was it proper? Was it right? And they formed this truly blue ribbon committee, senators, representatives, Supreme Court justices, chairman of Ivy League schools, and they met for three months and conducted 500 interviews to examine that question. Do you take an ethnic group and throw them into a concentration camp like we did back in 1942? Was it right? And the unanimous decision by this blue ribbon committee was it was absolutely wrong. It should have never been, for three reasons. It was based on racial prejudice, the hysteria of war, and the lack of political leadership. America, we made a mistake. I had friends tell me, George, you know, does that put closure? And I said, no. Why? It was wrong. I said, look, how can you erase four years of your life behind barbed wires. A document doesn't do it. But that's how it is. So today, as we sit here in the capital of Salem, let's remind ourselves that 
freedom is very, very fragile, and it remains fragile. How many of you here have visited the Statue of Liberty? Many of you. Good. And I remember, and you will remember, that great torch, lightning America to this land of opportunity, don't you? And you remember the tablet in the left that says July 4th, 1776. But how many of you that visited the Statue of Liberty noticed something on the foot? The foot of the Statue of Liberty. There's something there. I'll tell you what it is. Shackles and chains. Broken shackles and broken chains that indicate the end of slavery. And in the bottom of the Statue of Liberty, there's a poem written there. Have you ever read it? Most people don't read it. You walk right by it. It was written by a Jewish lady by the name of Emma Lazarus. It's a very short poem, and in the middle of that poem, there's a line that describes us. It simply says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses that yearn to breathe free. That is America. That is what we are all about. Yes. So I commend your group, your diversity, equity, and inclusion group. I commend your Oregon State Capital Foundation for doing the things you are to promote diversity, to promote equality. Diversity is very simple, isn't it? It's your choice inside you. It's up to each and every one of us. It's inside of all of us. We know that all men are created equal. The question is, if we treat each other equally. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Capital Foundation and, and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, we're so honored to have you. Uh, George is willing to take a couple of questions, if, you, if there are any. Um, you kept talking about the West Coast. Did the Japanese go any farther, like over the Rockies? Were there any other camps that were farther inland? So the question is, um, the focus was on the West Coast, but uh, were there any Japanese on the East Coast? When the immigrants come, they concentrated mostly on the West Coast. So there were over 127,000 Japanese on the West Coast. But there were isolated Japanese that lived in Utah, Denver, Chicago, New York. But we're talking very, very small numbers. As far as the camps are concerned, yes, there was a concentration camp in Manzanar, California. Topaz, Utah, Arizona. There are other camps in Arkansas. There are 10 different American concentration camps, yes. Ours happen to be in southern Idaho. So the, the ones that were, um, so the ones that were farther east, they also were sent? Or did they get to just stay um, in their home? Oh, like oh I see. Uh, the immigrants that were over 250 miles from the Pacific Ocean inland, they got to stay. However, uh, it's kind of hard to explain to you. It's a mobile society today, but the Japanese that came from Japan and lived on the West Coast, that's all they knew. They didn't know anything about Cleveland or you know, San Antonio. This was their area of comfort. So they stayed here, they were incarcerated from here, and then they went to camp quite obediently. Okay, question in the back. The question is if you if George sees any equivalency to what's happening currently um, by the fifteen thousand children that are current current for Central American children that are currently incarcerated. Order. Well, I sympathize with what's happening, and I'm very very sympathetic of families being split. There's a lot of wrong that's being done today. 
but those that conveniently equate it to the Japanese experience are wrong. It's totally different. Let me explain that. In 1942, there was a world war going on. There's not a world war going on today. We were forced out of our homes. People from Guatemala and Honduras are not taken from their homes. We can only bring that which we could carry. We, we were labeled with a, with a number. That's not happening today. Again, I'm very sympathetic with people, families being split, what's happening at the border. All I'm saying is it was very, very different. It's not a parallel. Some politicians like to say, oh, it happened to the Japanese, that which is happening at the border. I'm sympathetic with what's happening at the border, but please, it was very, very different for those of us incarcerated back in 42. A question in the back. So, so the question is, did George's family own property prior to being incarcerated and what became of that property? Well, you may know this, but <clears throat> America passed many, many laws. 1913, California had the alien land law. 1923 here in Oregon, where aliens, including Japanese immigrants, could not legally own property. So it's a matter of legality. So what happens in that case is you take a practical route. You may buy property and put it in your son's name or your friend's name. So yes, it is incorrect to say that they didn't own anything. They had it in their son's name, their daughter's name, another person's name. Uh, it is estimated that when we were incarcerated, the Japanese, the 120,000, they lost over $4 billion of assets. So they had businesses that they lost, they had property that they lost, they had automobiles, investments, they, their bank accounts were frozen. Uh, There's a lot of things that happened, and that was $4 billion that I'm talking about, $1942. It's kind of like when we went to camp, they did not allow us to take a camera into camp. If you were caught with a camera in the camp, it was a four, it was a $5,000 fine. If you convert that to $2,019, it would be $75,000 fine. My point is, everybody here probably has an iPhone or Samsung. And if you were stuck into camp, you would be fined $75,000. That's my point about sometimes you have to be careful with dollars. Got a question, right? Last question. Why did you choose to serve in the American military after they incarcerated your family? So the question was, why did you decide to serve in the military after your family was incarcerated? Well, I'm not a bitter person. I do have friends that don't want to talk about their experience at all. I'm quite the opposite. That's why I'm here today, by the way, because I want Americans, my fellow citizens, to know about what happened to us. And in the 1950s, um, yes, I served, and I served in Germany. I served at 7th Army Headquarters right near Stuttgart. And um, yes, I remain a, par a proud American. I'm very proud of this land. Today, I was very critical, because sometimes it's necessary to give straight facts so that you can understand what happened to an ethnic group. But no, I, I was very proud to serve in the U.S. Army. All right. Do you want to... I just want to thank everyone for coming today and invite you to enjoy some of the refreshments. And please join me in another round of applause for Mr. George Nakata.